Uh, I rise to um, speak in, uh, to new clause 18, which is the name of uh, myself and my honourable friend, the member for Cardiff West. But I'd also like to support the amendments in the honourable in the name of the honourable lady for devices again. The government proposals really do rely on an awful amount of goodwill amongst all these um, uh, stakeholders that are involved in the legislation, and it really does make sense to put that backstop power again for the regulator to require payment services to act should they not do so in the first instance. Um, but new clause 18 is looking at this from a slightly different perspective and it will put obligations on the age verification regulator to ensure that all age verification providers, which are the providers putting the tool on those websites to ensure compliance, are approved by the regulator, that they perform a data protection impact assessment, that they make this publicly available and uh, an array of other duties as well. And this new clause is designed to address some of the concerns around the practicality of the age verification checks, ensuring that data is as minimal as possible, that it is kept secure, that individuals' privacies and <coughs> liberties are protected, and that there is absolutely no possibility for data to be commercialised by pornographers. We raise this as a potential risk, given the proposals have been drafted with the input of the pornography industry, understandably. However, they would have a significant amount to gain from obtaining personal data from their customers, which they may not collect at present. Now, we have full confidence, as we said earlier in the BBFC, as regulator, but as with the proposals in Part 5, it is vital that some basic principles, but certainly not the minutiae of the detail, detail are put on the face of the bill, and we are certainly not asking anything unreasonable of the re regulator or of these age verification providers. Privacy, anonymity and proportionality should all be principles which underpin the age verification tool and which so far have not featured in any draft guidance, code of practice or accompanying bill documents as far as I am aware. And the Information Commissioner agrees with this. The ICO's response to the DCMS consultation on age verification <coughs> for pornography raised the concern that any solution implemented must be compliant with the requirements of the Data Protection Act and the privacy and electronic communications regulations that sit alongside the Data Protection Act. The concept of privacy by design would seem particularly re relevant in the context of age verification, that is, designing a system which appropriately respects individuals' privacy whilst achieving the stated aim. In practical terms, this would mean only collecting and recording the absolute minimum data required in the circumstances, having assessed what that minimum was. It would also mean ensuring that the purposes for which any data is used are carefully and restrictively defined and that any activities keep to those restricted purposes. In the context of preventing children from accessing online commercial pornography, there is a clear attribute which needs to be proven in each case. That is, whether an individual's age is above the required threshold. Any solution considered for the purposes of these proposals therefore needs to be focused on proving the existence or absence of that attribute to the exclusion of other more detailed information, such as the individual's actual date of birth. The Commissioner made very clear that there would be a very significant problem around any method of age verification that requires the collection and retention of documents <coughs> such as a copy of passport, driving licence, or other documents which are vulnerable to misuse or attractive to, to disreputable third parties. The collection and retention of such information multiplies the information risk for those individuals, whether the data is stored in one central database or in a number of smaller databases operated by different organisations in the sector. Now, I understand that the Adult Providers Network exhibited some of the potential tools that could be used to fulfil this requirement. From the summary I have read of that event, none of them seemed particularly satisfactory, but my favourite was put forward by a provider called Yoti, or Yoti, I'm not quite sure how we pronounce that one, Mr Stringer. The progress they suggest is as follows. Uh, the individual is to install the Yoti app. They then use that app to take a selfie to determine that you are indeed a human being. You are then to use that app to take a picture of any relevant government documents, your passport or driving licence, I imagine. The app then sends both documents to Yoti. Yoti, the third party, now sends both pictures to a fourth party. It was unclear whether personal data at that point is stripped before sending it to that fourth party. The fourth party goes back to Yoti if the images, i.e. the selfie and the government ID, match. Yoti cash caches the various personal data about the user, affirming that they are indeed over 18. 
Then, in order for this to work, the user will visit whatever porn site they, um, oh. they would like to visit at that time. <laughs> the porn site posts a QR-like code on screen. The user then loads the Yachty app. The user then has to take another selfie to prove that it is still them and not a child using the phone. The user scans the on-screen QR code, is told, this site wants to know if you are over 18 years old, do you approve? The user accepts. The Yoti app back channel informs the porn site that they are over 18 years old, and then the user can see the pornography. <laughs> now, I don't know if anyone on this committee watches online, online pornography. I gather the figure is over 50% of the population, and I'm not convinced that honourable members err to the more abstinent of the population. Um, but I <laughs> well, we heard evidence from the honourable lady. The <laughs> um, so I would ask members to consider whether they would like to go through a process as absurd as the one suggested. I, of course, oh, would she accept that, that in, in the name of research, people look at many things? <laughs> Daily oh, Mail uh, environment <laughs> when the FOI comes in for her Google search. Um, but I'm not convinced uh, that anybody would want to go through pr a process as absurd as the one I've just described, or even one significantly less convoluted, um, or whether they would in fact seek entertainment on a site that did not require such hurdles. Because the BBFC made quite a telling point in evidence, and indeed it is entrenched in Clause 23 of the Bill, that the majority of the viewing population get all their content from the top 50 sites, and so it is therefore very easy to target those. The issue with that is that it has the potential, as my honourable friend, the member for Chester, raised the committee, to push viewers onto the next 50 sites, and so on and so on. And that is why we need to ensure that the process is as straightforward and as minimal as possible. I'm most grateful uh, to my honourable friend from Cheviot Healy for giving way. My concern, of course, about the uh, users being pushed onto the next 50 and the next 50 is that they are much less regulated and much more likely to be, um, uh, may, may, may I, might I uh, hazard a guess, at the more extreme end uh, of the uh, spectrum. I'm very grateful to my honourable friend for that intervention. That's exactly my concern as well. The top 50 providers, I imagine, are. Uh, not as hardcore or less extreme, pot uh, potentially will not include violent images, as indeed if we move on to the next 50 and the next 50 and the next 50, then they have that danger of becoming more and more extreme. But in relation to this amendment, any solution must not result in the wholesale tracking or monitoring of individuals' lawful online activities or the collection of data with a view to unlawful profiling of individuals. I am not convinced that the BBFC are properly resourced to undertake the significant additional workload, and nor am I convinced that the practicalities of the software that have so far been exhibited and their implications have been properly worked out. Uh, I'm grateful again to my honourable friend. She's been very generous, and she's absolutely right about resourcing. I'm not no technical expert. Would she, would she not agree with me that um, such a, a, a database that was being kept might be a prime target uh, for hackers um, unless it was properly resourced and properly defended? Well, I think that's absolutely right, and it, I will come on to that um, later in uh, my remarks. Um, our evidence we heard from the BBFC. Uh, that they intended potentially to use uh, age-verified mobile telephony in order to uh, ensure that sites are properly age-verified. But I'm afraid, Mr Stringer, that that is also flawed. Firstly, there is the obvious issue that there is nothing to stop an underage child using the information attached to that phone, be it the phone number or the name of the owner, to log on and falsely verify. But equally, there are enormous privacy issues uh, with that use of um, mobile verified software in order to log on. The BBFC said that they were very clearly not interested in identity, merely the age of the in individual attempting to access online pornography. But as we all know, our smartphones contain a wealth of information that can essentially be used to create a virtual clone. They are loaded with our intimate conversations, our financial data, our health records, in many cases with the location of our children. There is a record of calls made and received, text messages, photos, contact lists, calendar entries, internet browsing history, which the Honourable Member for Devisers might want to take note of, um, <laughs> as well as access to email accounts, banking institutions and websites like Amazon, Facebook, Twitter and Netflix. Many people instruct their phones to remember passwords for these apps so they can be quickly opened, which means they are available to anyone who gets into the phone. 
Now, all of this is incredibly valuable information. It has been said that data is the new oil. Information that I imagine most people would not want to be obtained, stored, sold, or commercialized by online pornography sites. The risks of creating databases with potentially people's names, locations, credit card details, you name it, alongside their pornographic preferences should be quite clear to anyone in this room and should be forefront of people's minds given the recent Ashley Madison hack. I am not condoning anyone that used that website to look for extramarital affairs, nor am I privileging the preferences or privacy of people wishing to view online pornography over the clearly vastly more important issue of child protection. However, the consequences of that hack were the suicides of at least three individuals, and I think we should proceed with extreme caution before creating any process that would result in the storing of data that could be leaked, hacked, or commercialised, and that would otherwise be completely private and legitimate. Mm -hmm. This is the reasoning behind our very reasonable and straightforward amendment, which places a series of duties on the age verification regulator to ensure adequate privacy safeguards are provided for, that any data obtained or stored is not for commercial use, and that security is given due consideration. Unintended consequences of this proposal do not merely end at the blocking of preferences, privacy or security issues, but also at pushing users onto illegal or at the very least non-compliant sites. We are walking a very thin tightrope between making it too light touch as to be too easily passed by increasingly tech-savvy under-18s and between making it far too complicated and intrusive so as to push viewers onto either sites that are not using age verification but are still offering legitimate content or onto completely illegal sites that strain to much more damaging realms. Clearly, this will require a lot more consultation with the industry and I'm confident that the BBFC will do just that, but we would feel a lot more confident and assured on this side of the committee if it was required to adhere to these very basic principles that we should all hold dear. Privacy, proportionality and safety. Yeah. Yeah. Do you, do you want to speak before the something up, or shall I ask the Minister to speak? Uh, well, um, I wanted to speak, if I could, in relation to some uh, of those points. Um, so, so I think your lady, you know, right, rightly gets to, to the great concern that is out there, that there's always been a concern about this, that somehow in doing something good, there are an awful lot of, uh, of, of concern can be created. Um, and I am sympathetic to the points that she does make. Um, I did just want to, uh, of course, remind her that it's not as if these sites don't know who's visiting them anyway. And one of the great conundrums on the internet is that our, every single keystroke we take is tracked and, and registered. Indeed, that is why shopping follows you around the internet, you know, because you happen to have clicked on a particular site. And unless people are very clever in terms of their private browsing history, the same is absolutely the case for, for these commercial providers. So while she is right to be concerned about the conflation of identity and data, there is absolutely no sense that this is not uh, this information is not already out there and could be used for malicious purposes should somebody so intend. And I did just want to remind her uh, that you know, 86% of the public does think that putting age verification measures in place is a good thing. And I have always wanted to unleash the technological brilliance <coughs> of this country in coming up with the system. When we were looking at ways to uh, ensure filters were correctly turned off and on by adults, because of course in the households, often kids are more tech savvy than their parents. We heard about this, uh, your, your, the honourable gentleman's uh, tech savvy seven-year-old. How would you actually ensure that the filter uh, management was done by an adult? And, and we came up with a neat solution of course you have to be over 18 to enter into a contract to actually have the internet service and therefore as long as emails were sent to the, the account holder uh, it was a way of, uh, of restoring that loop if you like and of course passwords can be shared amongst families but there were really good attempts made to try and work out who was over 18 in the household and so it is my sense uh, and again, I'm sure she'd agree with me, we don't want the perfect to be the enemy of the good, that these are all very important points to make, but the BBFC is, is very experienced, and it ought to be able to design an age verification system that does meet her concerns. I'm very grateful uh, for the Honourable Lady for giving away. And uh, just place on record that we absolutely support the government's intention here. We just want to make sure that it is done in the right way and balancing um, both sides of the argument. But does she share my concern? I, I think it's absolutely right that the internet service providers are, uh, are offering this filter, that very few families actually either take it up or that very many families uh, do turn it off. 
Uh, well, uh, there is Ofcom data, actually. One of the requirements that we asked for was Ofcom to actually monitor it and take up, of course, uh, improve. But then, as I mentioned, some internet service providers now have an, an automatic on system whereby you have to intervene to take the filters off. And I'm told that only about 30% of families actually choose to do so. And the savvy thing, of course, is we all know that people live in uh, households with multiple ages and multiple requirements on the internet. Uh, ISPs now, many of them will offer a service where you can disable the filters for a period of time and they're automatically reinstated for the following days. You actually don't have to do anything if you want those filters uh, to be in place, but you quite rightly want, might want to access over 18 content as an adult in the household. Um, so, uh, Mr. Speaker, I, I wanted, uh, actually, I wanted to discuss some of the other issues that had come up uh, in the course of the conversation in the process of, of uh, finally speaking about these amendments. Would that, would that be in order to do so, or would you? Well, if it is covered by the amendments on um, six, Yes. And I can't tell until you start speaking. Yeah, it, it definitely is. And, and I misspoke at the beginning when I talked about New Clause 7. You're quite right to pick me up. So I was actually referring to New Clause 6. It was just my, my note taking. And, and I think what we have, what I was trying to put in place in this was a whole series of protections where you had takedown notices, sorry, where you had uh, enforcement notices that were acted upon, you had financial penalties that were actually uh, made a difference, and you also had uh, potentially the ability to stop income streams uh, moving from the, the payment providers uh, to the various providers of the content. Um, but I have uh, wanted to, to push the Minister on this question of blocking, because it does come back to why would anyone care? If it is the case that you don't uh, carry out, you don't respond to an enforcement notice, the fine isn't sufficient for you to stop or you shut down, you know, how, it, how can it be that we are not considering blocking, which of course we do do for other sites. And I know that it's not applicable to every form of illegal content, but I'm very struck by copyright infringement, which generates takedown notices uh, very swiftly, and upon which the, the, the entire provision of in internet service providers and ancillary services do act. So I would be really interested to hear from the minister on this question of blocking, why it is something that, that has been rejected so far, or whether it is something that perhaps potentially could be put in place as a backstop power, because I do worry that without that, all of this amazing progress will not have to you. Well, thank you very much indeed, and I think um, uh, uh, sometimes it's said that um, uh, uh, Parliament escapes over matters or doesn't get under the skin of things and I think that the discussion that we've just heard uh, amongst this committee shows a great deal of uh, analysis, experience uh, and wisdom uh, in many of the things that are said and um, I'm, uh, I think that the uh, debate around this, this bill has been enriched by it uh, and I'm very grateful for um, um, members on both sides who've made very good contributions to how we get this right because um, this is a, we are walk, this is, getting this right involves walking a tightrope, exactly as the old member for the front bench opposite said, um, between making sure that there is adequate enforcement and um, uh, um, appropriate access uh, for those for whom it is legally um, uh, uh, perfectly reasonable um, to access adult content. Um, and we've got to get that balance right. I, I think that that means that... that with, it, with that in mind, we've drafted um, some of the uh, clauses, and especially clause 22, uh, in a way to allow the regulator to um, operate with some freedom, because we also need to make sure this remains <coughs> a good system over time and isn't overly um, prescriptive. I thought it was ironic that in a speech about privacy, um, the Honourable Lady started to speculate about uh, which MPs enjoyed watching porn, uh, but um, uh, um, but I'm I, I'm de I'm definitely I'm definitely I'm, defi I'm, defi I'm, I'm, I'm definitely not going to do that. Uh, the um, uh, uh, the, uh, the, um, the the truth is that um, uh, age verification technology is developing all of the time. Um, online date online personal identity. Uh, techniques are developing all the time. Indeed, the British government is one of the leading uh, lights in terms of, try in terms of developing verif um, identity verification um, software, which is also um, uh, minimizes the data needs for that verification. 
um, and doesn't rely on, on large, especially large state databases in order to do it and therefore does it in a relatively uh, libertarian way, if I can put it that way. Um, doing, so providing for verification of identity or indeed age, because age without um, named identity is, is what is really being sought here, but very difficult to achieve. Um, it, it, that is a, it's an incredibly important area um, and there's a huge amount of um, uh, resource going into this globally to get it right. Um, and it ties, of course, very closely to the cyber security and data protection requirements of any data. Now, the Data Protection Act in the UK um, is, has, a, has a very broad consensus behind it and has a simple principle that within a, an institution, data can be uh, shared, but between institutions, data must not be, and, and, the data, and the institution that holds the data is responsible for its safekeeping, uh, and that there are very significant fines um, that are um, possible for losing it inadvertently. And indeed, the, um, the, uh, the, the general data protection regulation, which is uh, forthcoming, uh, increases those uh, fines. And I think that the, rather than reinventing data protection law for the purposes of age verification in this one case, it, it is better to rest on the long-established um, case law of, of data protection that the Information Commissioner uh, is the lead on. Um, the, on the question of whether regulators, uh, on the question of search engines, I thought we had a very informed debate about the role of search engines. Um, the regulator will be able to consider whether a search engine is an ancillary service provider. Um, we don't specify, but I would expect um, ISPs to be regarded as ancillary service providers. That will be for um, the regulator. Uh, when it came to the name of payment providers who are already engaged, rather than um, enforced engagement, uh, we already have engagement from Visa, MasterCard, UK Cards Association, and the eMoney Association, uh, and clearly there's a lot more organisations that can and should be <coughs> engaged. Yeah. Um, and it's interesting he, he feels able to say that he would expect uh, internet service providers um, to be regarded as an ancillary service provider. But he didn't use the same terminology when talking about search engines. So could I just press him on that? Would he expect search engines to, in some cases, be considered, or maybe in all cases, ancillary service providers? Um, well, I don't I draw any distinction between the two. Um, I think that uh, but the decision is for the regulator. The legislation provides that um, they could be, um, and it depends on the circumstances whether they would be. And of course, they provide, they, they provide, they play different roles, um, very obviously. <coughs> Just to clarify, I think, he, I think he's saying actually that in making no distinction, then he would be able to apply the word expect to, um, uh, to search engines as well as internet service providers. That's what I was probing him to find out. Oh, well, I'm, I'm choosing not to use that word oh, so he is um, uh, because I want to leave it um, to the regulator. Uh, rather than uh, leave an implication um, um, that, um, that they ought to move one way or the other. They ought to define what is an ASP according to the legislation. Um, one last time, but, but therefore he is making a distinction. I think it has to be said in front of the committee between the two. In one case, he clearly has an expectation that will happen. In the other case, he doesn't. And I think the committee would be interested to know why the minister is making that distinction, which he denied he was making, um, because I think it's important to us understanding, it's an important to us understanding the, the reluctance within the bill to uh, involve search engines um, in some of these regulations. Yeah. Uh, they, they, uh, they should be treated the same in that the same provisions in the bill should be applied to each. Um, and um, there's a, um, a, a, but each perform a different role, um, and ISPs inevitably are more are more closely connected with the provision of content because the content rests on and uh, it goes through an ISP, whereas a search engine may or may not be the route to which content is found. Um, the, but, 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 where I, for, but for purposes of the um, implementation of the bill, it is clear 
that it is for the regulator to decide within the provisions as set out in the bill. Yeah. Thank you, Madam I thank the Minister for giving way, but I, I refer him to the point made by his honourable friend, the honourable member for uh, Devizes. Um, in, when she mentioned the killing of April Jones, the murder of April Jones, and the fact that her killer was able to type certain words, which I can't really yeah. bear to repeat, into yeah. a search engine. Yeah. She, search engines have the power to change their algorithm. Yes. We know they do. Yeah. Well, the, the, I think the point that the, uh, my own friend was making uh, was that due to her work, on a voluntary basis, the search engines did make precisely those sorts of changes. And now they undertake, at the request of the government and others, millions of changes to their algorithms and millions of takedowns um, for both uh, child porn and for terrorist related purposes uh, and that system is working well whether that system uh, that system does not need to be underpinned by regulation in order to work well um, but there is then a wider question um, which I am straying to the limits of order in order to discuss but to respond to uh, the argument that was very, I thought, very effectively put by uh, my own friend for devices, okay. which is that, which is that um, there, the principle that the internet uh, ought to um, uh, provide the freedom that it does within a framework of a regulated structure is one that we clearly agree with because we are providing for some of that regulated structure in this bill. There is an argument, a sort of First Amendment type argument, if you think about it in an American way, that the internet is free and laissez-faire and we should not regulate on the internet. And there are people who say we shouldn't recreate, for instance, national jurisdictional boundaries on the internet and we shouldn't regulate the internet. It should be completely <coughs> free. We reject that argument and that's why we're prepared to put age verification uh, um, um, uh, requirements, legal requirements into the uh, provision of information over the internet in the UK jurisdiction and we reject that argument because at a very principled level um, the freedoms that we enjoy are freedoms um, to, that also um, do not harm others um, and that applies offline just as it uh, uh, just as much as it applies online, but because the internet is relatively new, um, we're still in the early days of applying this sort of principle um, to the internet, and that's a that's a much bigger debate than um, than than in um, than clause 22 of this bill, and therefore I don't think I should go much further into detail of it, uh, Mr. Stringer. I'm grateful to him for giving way again, but I believe what he's just said answers my honourable friend, the Honourable Member for Cardiff West, question about whether or not an internet service provider is an ancillary service provider yeah. because um, of the way the, he has acknowledged that an internet service provider, sorry, search engines, search engines right. are also and should be considered not as, as well as ISPs. Right. Well, all I did was set out the principles behind the government's um, position on the, its response to the uh, amendments to clause 22 of the bill. Um, and um, um, uh, 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 and, and I think you've got to have those principles in order to be able to know the direction that you're taking in terms of um, regu regulation. Um, if you're moving on to some of the other points um, the, the, um, that, um, that were made, um, the, um, I wanted to turn to um, my uh, responding to New Clause 18 and Amendment 79. New Clause 18 calls for an age verification regulator to approve age verification providers and would require the regulator to publish a code of practice. Um, and Amendment 79 requires the regulator to publish guidance under Clause 22.6, rather than having discretion to do. However, um, I don't think these are uh, necessary, not least because the regulator has the power to publish um, guidance about the circumstances in which it will treat services as enabling or facilitating. And going further isn't necessary, given the BBFC's <coughs> commitment to create proportionate and robust regulatory regime. Uh, and also decisions on age verification method or tools, which were an important part of the debate. Um, this is, a, this is a, a very important part of what we're um, putting forward. The regulator is required under Clause 15 to publish guidance setting out the types of arrangements which it will treat as compliant. So I don't think we then need to insert it into Clause 22. Um, as well. So with that response to the points uh, that were make it made, uh, I hope that these amendments can be withdrawn. But can I thank the committee for the work that they, for the, for the, for the, for the contributions they made in consideration of these, these matters.
Claire Perry. Uh, well, I do thank the Minister for that. I, I would have liked to hear him say a little bit more about um, sort of how the payment service providers are involved in the game and whether uh, we are relying on them to um, to do the right thing because they are large corporate companies or whether, as my member or my new call six might have given, that there was an opportunity uh, okay. to yeah. strengthen the wording. Hey, I, I, I apologise. There was so much um, interesting, so many interesting points made. I didn't get to that one. Um, the uh, provision of form without a um, age verification in the UK will become illegal um, under this bill. Um, there is a vast um, panoply of financial regulation uh, requiring that uh, financial organisations do not engage with uh, organisations that commit um, I illegal activities. Um, and it is through that well embedded um, international um, set of regulations that we intend to, um, uh, to ensure that, um, the, the, that the payment providers um, don't engage with those who don't uh, follow what's set out here. And rather than invent a whole new system for that, we are essentially piggybacking on a very well established financial control system. Well, I thank the Minister for, for a very, uh, that's a very reassuring uh, uh, reply and, and I think we actually have had a very good debate. I know his officials will be listening and thinking hard about what has been said and I don't think it would serve the committee uh, any purpose to move my amendments or my new clause to a vote. Is your pleasure that the amendment be withdrawn? Aye. Aye. Amendment by leave withdrawn. The question is that Clause 22 stand part of the bill. Louise Hay. Uh, thank you, Mr Stringer. Um, it's interesting to hear the Minister uh, reference financial regulations here. I, I, I mean, I wasn't present at second reading because I wasn't in this position uh, then, but I don't believe on reading that that there was any reference there. So. Um, we would like some clarity on who will be the regulator of the payment services providers and what work has been done with, I assume it with the Financial Con Conduct Authority in this uh, circumstance, what work has been done with them already to ensure that they will be regulating those, to ensure that the payment service providers act uh, with speed and with due yeah. diligence on receiving notification from the age verification regulator in uh, uh, under clause under clause 15 yeah. um, it's disappointing that the uh, government does not consider uh, new clause 18 necessary to amend um, the bill I appreciate that the BBFC has been given powers to establish a code of practice but I do think given the very serious uh, consequences that could come about of this not being done right um, I do think that some basic principles do need to be embedded into that based on the issues that I raised earlier in the discussion. Um, I would just like to say, Mr Stringer, that we will be returning to this at report stage.